Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tracy Barkley. I'm program coordinator with Solo Grazia Farm. We are a small vegetable farm in Urbana. Um, it's a project of St. Matthew Lutheran Church and Faith in Place. It's a mission-driven farm. Our mission is to donate at least 10% as much as possible really to the Eastern Illinois, Illinois Food Bank for distribution in our community of fresh local produce. Um, so with that I'd like to like make sure everybody knows that there is a uh, postcard on your seat about a fundraiser for the farm and for Eastern Illinois Food Bank. We're going to be showing A Place at the Table, which is a film about hunger, uh, what hunger looks like and how we can work together to alleviate hunger in our community, which is something that Eastern Illinois Food Bank is doing very, very well, and we are working to try and support their work by increasing our donations. So the proceeds that come from this film will be to help enable Sola Grazia to be able to increase our, our donations of produce to the farm. So I hope that you will take this, share with your friends, show up, enjoy the film and a discussion before and afterwards. And there are also some posters out on the table. If you have a place to post these posters or if you're with an organization, please take one and do so. So um, I'm also a committee member for the Friday Forum Food Justice Series. And in our committee discussions in prep for the series, one thing that was very clear is that a lot of the successful strides in uh, local foods movement are happening in our own community and we have some uh, outstanding heroes that are meeting great success and are working in different folds and in diff with different strategies um, to do so. So we're lucky to have a panel of four such individuals with us today. Um, we have Don Blackman who works at, at the neighborhood level with the Randolph Community Garden. We have Brad Yukin, with the, he's the manager of the Champaign um, Farm Bureau, and he's working also the, um, as part of the Local Foods Policy Council and a local foods project out of Rantoul. We have Natalie Kenny Marquez, who runs the Urbana Farmers Market, and we have Rick Weinzerall, who's an extension specialist with the university's crop sciences program and also helps to head up the Beginning Farmer program. I'm doing short intros because I really want for them to take the time to tell more about what they're doing with the local food movement and to expand local food in our community. So I'm going to ask each of them to take a few minutes to expand on the introduction and share what they are doing and feel like they're doing well um, in partnership with this community for local foods. So Don. Hi. Well, the Randolph Street Community Garden, I am the volunteer steward. The garden uh, is 14 years old this year. We have 55 raised beds, up from eight when I took over seven years ago. The garden, though, especially for you students, was started by an urban planning student who, as part of her research, revealed the fact that the North End is a food desert where food cannot be purchased within, healthy vegetables cannot be purchased within a walk. and. Um, when she graduated, the master gardeners took over and when they withdrew, I stepped in because the garden was gonna be plowed under and I knew that there was a reason for it. So I was not originally a gardener. I didn't garden as a kid, but the master gardener, Christine Bakhti, who was there, was a very good teacher and I've been able to add to the knowledge and it's just become a mission when I paired it with our church's food pantry, it kind of took off, and here I am. Um, so I'm with the, the Champaign County Farm Bureau, and, and local foods is part of agriculture. There's no question about it, but specifically, uh, we are working with a group of individuals that has, um, well, let me put it this way. There's several challenges to getting involved in local food production, one of it being land. Uh, so we are working with a group of individuals in the Rantoul area that has access to land. In fact, we have about 16 acres available for individuals that want to get into local food production. Uh, the land is available at a low cost lease and it's for individuals that really want to try to make this a career, not the individuals that are kind of wanting to make this a hobby. And so we've been able to uh, match land with individuals that, that maybe have not had access to it. You can't go to a farm sale in Champaign County and buy one acre or two acres or five acres of land. Uh, that's just not the way it works. Unless you have connections to get access to land, it can be very challenging to find land to make local food production your career. 
That's why we started this. We are in the process of leasing land as small as three quarters of an acre, all the way up to five, six, seven acres to individuals who want to get started into the local food industry. Uh, we again, have, in partnership with the village of Rantoul, have 16 acres available, give or take. Uh, we've got about uh, 12 of those rented, so we still have about four acres left for 2015. There's potential for further growth as we move forward if there's demand for it. Uh, but again, our goal is to help individuals who have challenges finding land that want to make this a career, match them with that land. The second aspect of what we're doing in Rantoul is also we have today an operational food hub. We have uh, equipment to clean and wash the food with. We have areas for sorting and grading, and we also have refrigeration unit. Uh, our goal is to take aggregation uh, by the individuals on the land in Rantoul or those not involved in the Rantoul project from the land aspect to help them with aggregation and to kind of get started with uh, uh, storing of that equipment so that if an individual that maybe uh, is existing today uh, maybe has an agreement with the local restaurant but their product is ready on Tuesday and the restaurant needs it on Thursday, they have refrigeration space to, uh, to store that for two days. So uh, we also, again, so the food hub is a second aspect of that, and you could also consider aggregation sort of a third part of that. Uh, we have reached out to potential buyers, and there is a high demand, of course, uh, for products that we can aggregate and source uh, for these individuals and companies out of the Chicago area as well as uh, East Central Illinois. So uh, there's really three aspects of our project that we're working on. I'm Natalie Kenny Marquez. I am the director of Urbana's Market at the Square. That's the farmer's market in Urbana that, take pla that takes place from the first weekend of May through the first weekend of November. Um, rain or shine at Illinois and Vine. It's like a broken record. I see it all the time. Um, I've been with the market since August of 2012, um, but I'm no stranger to the community. I'm actually the seventh generation of my family to live in Champaign County. Um, my family started their farm in 1857, I believe it was, and I, I've seen pictures of myself out at my family's farm, but um, I don't remember it as a child, and that's one thing that's been great for me is to have the opportunity to get back into um, agriculture, not necessarily as a farmer, but as someone to help the farmers and the growers and producers out at the market. And one thing I've enjoyed is um, turning the market into um, a place for entrepreneurs. I like to sit down with potential vendors or new vendors or even returning vendors and talk about their their business, um, what they're doing, how they can better tell their story and promote their products and and showcase that to our customers out at the market. So um, that's been great for me and we have last year 200, over 220 registered vendors and community groups total at the market. Um, that's not to say they come every weekend. We can't hold that many on any given weekend. But over the course of the 27 or 28 weeks, um, that's how many folks we had participate as vendors and community groups last year. So excited to talk more about that with you today. Okay, my name is Rick Weinzerl. I uh, put on as many chairs as we could, uh, a little four-page handout. I'm an extension specialist, faculty member in entomology in the College of Aces. Uh, I teach about bugs. Uh, my research is on insect and, well, insect development and management in fruits and vegetables. So I've been working with the horticulture industry for a lot of years. Um, a couple of years ago, we submitted a proposal for a beginning farmer grant, and that's described on the front of these pages on that handout. So we do new farmer training and fruit and vegetable production at a few locations around the state. Um, that program will expire in August and we've submitted a renewal proposal to expand our locations and uh, add to our content. In a broader way, I'd like you to be aware at least of what Extension in Illinois does. There is a map of, uh, on the back of that page of the locations for Extension educators in local food systems and small farms. They're scattered around the state. Uh, there's another one that's not on there that was just hired in, in Cook County. These are the folks who help provide factual information about uh, fruit and vegetable production and also other small farm production, so animals, uh, eggs, uh, 
fiber, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, I attached a copy of a portion of the latest issue of the Illinois Fruit and Veg News just because it has a listing of a lot of programs. Um, our, our effort in new educators for local food systems and small farms is rather recent. It dates back only about four years. Uh, but we do a lot of other programs aimed at farmer training and all of the folks who come to these kinds of programs are supplying local food systems. We don't have exporters growing fruits and vegetables in Illinois, at least not enough to matter. So the folks who come to these programs are trying to provide for local food systems. And I just sort of advocate for extension a little bit and say that last year was the 100th anniversary of extension for U.S. Department of Agriculture in the U.S. Um, and that uh, extension is a little different than outreach from other faculty members. Outreach is typically, I do this particular kind of research and I'd like to tell you about it. Extension is, you have a problem and I try to answer it. And those are two different things. So extension does that kind of work around the state and a lot of us do that work in local food systems and small farms. Great, thank you. Um, so you can see from our panel, we have a range of um, folks working on can people support increasing access to resources, to growing food, getting the training and education they need to grow food, connecting um, local community members with the producers as consumers, and then also neighborhoods getting together and growing their own food. So I think you guys did a great job of framing what you're working on. Can you brag a little bit about what you feel like you've accomplished, or your program has accomplished, or what you feel really good about what's what's working with what you're doing right now Done. well uh, we've grown quite a bit since the garden started it started off as eight beds and now we're at 54 we were just given a little more land to put beds on we garden on land owned by unit 4 school district so one of the things that we have done is to partner with them to provide for the next generation of gardeners. We have a garden club at Stratton Elementary School and they grow our starts. They grow some of our starts. Each child next week will get seed and the graduated part, pots and soil to take home to grow the starts. And then in the spring, they come and plant a bed that is the bed, our, our giveaway bed. So that if someone comes to the garden who needs an onion and tomato and some things for dinner, we have a, a bed that is filled with things that they can pick. We run the garden as a cooperative. Each gardener is asked to plant a row of starts for any gardeners who come late in the season because it's easier to hook people on gardening if you give them a plant to take care of as opposed to a seed that they know is in the ground and may or may not come up. And some of the gardeners who have larger beds are also asked to plant one row of our cash crop. Our aim is to make the garden self-sufficient. And so to meet that end, we have established a garden market right there in the neighborhood because it is a food desert. We first started selling at a fish market that was just next to the, bar, to the garden, but we recently moved our market to the, the parking lot of Champaign Church of the Brethren. We offer on-the-go service. We have developed a clientele of people with special needs, handicapped people. They don't even have to get out the car. They just pull in, and the young people who man the market, uh, anywhere from 12 to 20, take over, go over, find out what they're shopping for that day, and take a basket over to the car so they can choose what they want. We're also servicing the community, the wider community, because um, healthy fruits and vegetables are more than a walk away, a good walk along sometimes the highway where there's not much room on the shoulder. So people can come and spend their money in the community, and it helps in two ways. It helps them to access healthy fruits and vegetables that they can get home more easily without having, if they don't have a car, without having to take a cab or the bus. But we're also training the young people who garden in sales and customer service and marketing. They're involved in all facets of our, our marketplace. So they receive 
a stipend that is a portion, a percent of the sales. So they've got a vested interest in making sales. And they also have cash crops of their own to which they tie 10% back to the garden so that we can replace our hoses and buy new tools and those kinds of things. So I'm trying to make the garden not only just a source for food, but a source for employment and training. Last year was our first year as part of the job training program for Unit 4 schools. We had five young people who were part of the training program and two young people who missed the program because they weren't eligible for it but came to garden anyway. <laughs> and uh, we were able to uh, have a five-day week program for young people, a half-day garden camp uh, for children school age, five and up. So we had a number, we had 15 young children who shared a bed. They had a, a four by eight half of a bed each. And they grew and their parents grew with them. We had everything from watermelon to, I can't, we had even some, some uh, melons and things that we weren't quite what they were. <laughs> <laughs> they they crossbred. And, and, and they were kind of like a squash and kind of like something else. Mm -hmm. They weren't poisonous, so. <laughs> but we had uh, volunteer pumpkins, because our, our patch really isn't big enough to grow a lot of pumpkins, but a pumpkin that we discarded grew in our compost bin and yielded 54 pumpkins. So, next year, I think we're going to intentionally put some pumpkins in the compost bin. It kept the dirt in the compost bin as it changed, and it gave the kids a, a lot of fun picking them and pulling the vines, and the kids in the neighborhood were starting to call it our pumpkin patch, and it was just pumpkins that grew in the compost bin. Uh, we also are like to position the garden as a gathering place for building community. We have a number of community events that we host. We are the end uh, point for the Freedom Ride, which is a celebration of Juneteenth. We hold a garden party every year where the whole community is invited and we have a really good turnover. Last year it turned out like 200 people came out in costume from the Roaring Twenties. We played badminton and we lawn bowled and we listened to cool jazz. We had a youth, orchestra, youth jazz band came and played for us. And it's a good fun, it's a fun time. We have our garden pig out there. He's not real, he's ceramic, he's just a giant belt bank. And it's an opportunity for people to feed the pig if they want to support the garden. And because uh, the school district's not going to let us have a pig out there, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we would like to have chickens. We, the city won't even let us have chickens. So, <laughs> because you have to have chickens in the house attached to a dwelling. So, because I was already buying chicks for the kids for Easter, and I thought, we'll buy them chicks for Easter. They can bring them to the garden, look after them there. But not to be. But. Okay, so you named a lot of successes in one constraints, which will. We'll talk about it in the next okay. <laughs> section. Brad, what would you like to talk about? You know, our project uh, just started here in 2015, so basically anything we do has been a major accomplishment. But, <laughs> but, uh, but really what, what sticks out to me is, is, again, identifying that challenge of individuals that want to get started in local food production. And one of their challenges, again, I'm not saying it's the only one, but one of their challenges being land access and being able to solve that for them. Uh, and being able to work with them. And I just think that's, that's the, the original intent. We were able to accomplish that and work with the Village of Rantoul on leasing some land. And again, we've got individuals that are, that are signing leases today to become farmers on that land. And these individuals uh, have not had that opportunity before this year. So that's probably my biggest uh, uh, thing that I think we're most proud of of is that uh, you know an idea uh, that started after a meeting on a drive home of, of just thinking about that has come to fruition that uh, we're able to to knock down a portion of that barrier so great thanks Brad. so to be totally honest when I came on board in August of 2012 the season well had been running since May and my goal was for any of you as customers or as vendors 
to not notice a change from the previous director to me coming on board. I wanted to make sure you could still go Saturday, get everything you needed, and um, that the whole thing wouldn't just, you know, disappear. And so um, that end of the season was a, a learning process for me because as a customer coming into it, then as the director, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes, and we were talking a little bit about that before the program started today. Um, but one of the big changes, and I think it was an improvement to the market that I made going into 2013, is we, we put the market online. So vendor applications are now online, and all of that information um, goes into an online market map and a search tool. So our customers can see a map that pops up with a drop-down menu of all of the dates of the market season. You can click around the map to see who will be there on what weekend. It will link to that vendor's um, social media or website. It has their telephone number. It says um, where, they, where their farm's located or where their products are made in Illinois. Um, so that was a, a big step forward um, for us and it's been helpful as the, the market director to have that and it's been helpful for the vendors too and hopefully for the customers as well, especially with the search tool. You could type in carrots and then it will show you all of the vendors that sell carrots. Um, it'll show you where they're going to be at in the market map that Saturday. And it also shows you when they'll have carrots available, which is a big thing as teaching um, the seasons and, and what you can find. And um, So that's been a big uh, thumbs up on my part and for the, the vendors. Um, the other thing that I'm really proud of is the partnerships that we've built. Um, the market, this is our 36th season in Urbana, um, but I feel like over the past... Um, five years at least, uh, we've developed some great partnerships um, with a few statewide organizations. One is the Illinois Stewardship Alliance and the other is the Illinois Farmers Market Association. Um, the Illinois Stewardship Alliance, they're based out of Springfield, but I've been trying to get them to do more things in the Champaign-Urbana area. And so for the past few years, we've um, hosted a chef farmer mixer where we get farmers and chefs together. In the first year, it was almost like speed dating. They had an opportunity to get to know one another, and, um, and then it's, it's grown, and this year it's going to be even bigger and better than last year. Um, they also, the Stewardship Alliance um, and the market and some other folks in Champaign-Urbana um, plan the local flavors, lunches, and dinners that happen throughout, um, let's see, it's usually o April through October. And it's a, a chance for restaurants in Champaign-Urbana to use local products, local ingredients um, in their menu, whether for lunch or dinner, and give you another opportunity to um, go out to eat and have that local produce available, or meat, or honey, or dairy, whatever it may be. Um, and then with the Illinois Farmers Market Association, it's, it's a chance for me to be able to meet with folks and talk about policies and rules and regulations as they apply to farmers markets. Um, there's been some changes over the past couple of years even just in the past year with product transparency. And as a market manager, I have to think about that um, and work with the vendors to make sure that you as customers know where your products are coming from. We strive at Urbana's Market at the Square to be a producer-only market, meaning that the vendors that are at our market are the ones that make, create, and grow the items that they're selling. And we consider local to be within the state of Illinois. And so those are some things that I think have been um, you know, opportunities for us, and I'm, I'm proud of what we've accomplished over the past few years, and lots of things to come this year. We'll talk about that later. Great. Thank you. Rick? Well, we're a knowledge business, uh, but we also count numbers. So um, in three years of doing the program, assuming most all of the people who are in it now finish this year, that's three separate classes. We will see roughly 270 people complete at the three locations put together, and roughly 30 to 35 of those will be in our Spanish language program parallel sites uh, at different parts of the state. Um, for this last year, for both St. Charles and Urbana, St. Charles, Illinois, and Urbana, we had more applicants than we could accept for these programs. And we do limit these to people who intend to farm, not to be master gardeners and grow for their families. Our criteria you know, are, include that you have to plan to grow to sell. And because we get more applicants than we can accept, we make some decisions about who is the most likely candidate to succeed. We will have from the two, well, 
largely from the first two years classes. There will be in the neighborhood of 100 acres of fruit and vegetable production uh, in 2015 that results from people who are in our class and either had not started or were just getting started. That doesn't sound like a lot in Champaign County with great big farms for corn and soybeans, but in fact 100 acres of fruits and vegetables, uh, gross sales on each of those acres ought to be $15,000. That's one and a half million dollars of sales that ought to come from that. That doesn't count the high tunnels and the high intensity acreage. There is a lot more food being grown because these people are in these the roles they're in now. Um, some of the grads are in the audience. Nicole Bridges is here, Todd Satterthwaite, and Dawn is actually in the class now. So anyway, we do include community garden managers and teachers of, uh, well, of food production classes. In a broader sense for extension, um, February is a, well, January and February are great travel months for all of us who do extension programs. Uh, Illinois Specialty Crops Conference was in Springfield in January, roughly 600 people in attendance for a three-day conference, not all of them all three days. These are the folks who grow fruits and vegetables in Illinois, and they are selling them locally in Illinois. Uh, did we teach them everything they need to know? No, but they must think we're valuable enough to spend a couple of days with us to learn more. So that's what we're supposed to do. This week I spent a day in Mount Vernon, a day in Hardin, and a day in Rockford. Nice travel schedule for winter. And in the course of that, for two tree fruit meetings and one fruit and vegetable conference, we talked to about 200 people. Those folks come to learn how to do their jobs better because we some of us and some others we bring in to help us, our, our jobs are to help them do that better. So I think, I think those are success stories. I think we are helping people produce food. Uh, we are in a knowledge business. We help them learn how to do it. Uh, that matters because um, you can say, I have, to, I have to sell a tomato or my tomatoes for $5 a pound in the western suburbs of Chicago to make a living in my short season. That might be a floor price for a farmer there. Four dollars is probably a more realistic floor price. In southern Illinois, a ceiling price is two dollars. Somebody has to be able to produce more efficiently, differently, meet their market. That's what we have to help people do. And we have to help people sell produce at, at prices that not just the more elite uh, markets for organic produce might might meet. We have to be able to grow food at prices people can afford. And part of that is by teaching the efficiency of production. So that's what we do. Great. So if we look at the panel, we have a community garden which is four or 14 years old? 14. 14 years old. We have a market that's 36 years old. We have a new um, at, you know, program for beginning farmers um, in Rantoul, addressing some of the land access issues. We have Beginning Farmers Program that's a couple of years old. So I mean, this to me is really impressive to think about how far the local foods movement goes back in Urbana, going back to the market, and then how many new ideas are on the table and actually getting funding and support. Um, and I think in this audience, there's probably a lot of people that also have farm dreams, community uh, organization, or neighborhood dreams. But I think we've, also, we've heard already about some of the constraints that either you've met and, and achieved, but there surely are more to that are kind of standing in the way of you achieving what you really, in the longer run, hope to for your program. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about what are some of the things that the general population might not understand about you know, what you're up against every day or how hard it is to motivate people to get involved with your program or um, you know, in central Illinois, what, what are we facing and what can we maybe um, in the audience do to help support um, you in meeting those goals. That's a lot. And we don't have to go in order. You guys can, you can do popcorn and answer mm -hmm. it as you feel motivated. Well, one of the things for Randolph Street is we're landlocked. Uh, the school has given us, the school district has given us as much land as they can in that location. We have room for four more beds, and I have a waiting list of eight families. Wow. So we're looking for more land. I'm look, investigating taking a half acre plot out of the farms. 
but then transportation is an is issue. So I'd really like to find an another lot there in the neighborhood where we could still access the kitchen for all the cleaning things that we need to do. And we'll have, and, but that's going to need more people who know what they're doing because you can't just throw new gardeners on the corner and say, oh, okay, call me at, the, at Randolph on the cell if you need any help with anything. So the, we're working on that. The kitchen, is that a personal kitchen issue or a, um, like a certified kitchen that people have access it's to? It's a personal kitchen. Personal That's kitchen. been an issue because we grow things and the next national, natural next step is preparing or, or storing or canning. And so we do canning classes and dehydration classes, uh, but we're not a certified kitchen and we kind of walk on eggshells because we have the, there are rules. You have to have a restaurant style certified kitchen to give away food in Champaign. And we're working on accessing funds to do um, upgrade of the refrigeration and uh, as each item you know, rather than trying to spend $100,000 we don't have to upgrade the whole kitchen, we're, try, we're trying to do it piecemeal. To uh, first refrigeration, then the dishwashers or the, and the stoves. But last year we had six canning classes that had at least six people in each. And we put up so much stuff, it was just really a lot of fun and it was really gratifying to see people who didn't garden before go all the way from gardening to, to walking out with their case of, of tomatoes that they canned. And we have a lot of young people who are gardening with us, so these are skills that they're learning early at, you know, from five to 15 that they can carry forward with them in their, to, through their whole life. It is important for people who are at risk for hunger to be able to take control of some of those resources to provide for themselves. Um, it's wonderful to be able to be in a position to have a food pantry and to give people food, but it is fabulous to be able to teach people to grow their own food and to preserve their own food. And we see people grow and come back and help the next year. We, we're short on beds because people don't leave. If they move from the area, they leave. Mm -hmm. And we have groups that come and just help grow for the food pantry and for in our bed, is, or the gleaner's bed is what I call it, the gleaner's bed, for people who just have a, a spot of hunger. They need something tonight for dinner, or they want to uh, add, try something, a different fruit or vegetable. The, the difficulties that we encounter in staying within the rules, uh, and the stress that it brings <laughs> is probably the, the, um, the hardest part of doing it. I mean, we have been able to interest people by showing them it's to their benefit and not intimidating them. I'm the most, the least intimidating person in the garden. Some people who garden now, who had tried to garden before, tell me that they, they stayed because I, I didn't throw what I knew in their face. Well, I didn't know anything. <laughs> I mean, taking this class that I'm taking, I'm amazed at how little I knew. But I just had a book, you know, and if somebody came in July, instead of saying, oh, you have to get a bed in April, you have to arrange to have your bed by the end of April, or you, can't, you have to wait till next year, we just got the book out and said, okay, what can we grow in July? You know, so we, we had, we grew because every time somebody came who wanted a bed, we found two pieces of wood and put it up against two other pieces of wood and called it a bed. I mean, we, were, we, we actually were up over 50 beds three years ago. But they were like L-shaped. The bed was an H. You know, we crossed over the line the school district gave us and we lost 10 beds when they pulled us back, you know. At that hill, what is happening? If, there's, if it's grass, why is my, you know, they won't let us have sheep. So I feel like vegetables should be growing there, something people can eat. So you're not short on people wanting to offer help. You're not short on people needing help. You're short on land and some other resources and some You know, we, we restrict scrounge rules. tools, okay? I shop basement sales, garage sales. Anytime I go into Home Depot, I ask them for a $25 gift card that they have for nonprofits, and then we name the tool that we buy after Home Depot. But um, 
we have a lot of people involved that are new to gardening. So if, when we get people who have gardened before and know the ropes kind of, we try and pair them together. So it's always great to have a core of people who know how to garden, who are in and out of the garden and accessible, especially to our young children gardeners. They live in the neighborhood, they walk in. They're gonna come water their, their um, vegetables, but they, need, they don't always recognize what weeds are. And they, they're not always there with me. I mean, we tripled our yields by putting picks in the garden that showed the mature plant on one side and mm -hmm. the immature plant on the other side. Have you ever seen a seed packet with a picture of an immature plant on it? No. Mm -hmm. And when they come up, if you don't know what it looks like, it's a weed. So, so it's um, those kind, the, the community garden is like about being a community garden. And we want to build community in that. So sometimes people just simply come in and spend the day. And they help out wherever they can. And they answer questions. The, the young seven, eight-year-old girls came running up to me one day last year when I came to the garden. Miss Dawn, we were gardening with the college girls. <laughs> a couple of sorority sisters came up and, and planted a bed. And they were there gardening. And these young kids were so excited that they were gardening with the college girls. And now they're talking about, well, we're going to go up to the college. We, we want to go to the open house. You know, I've been trying to get them to the open house <laughs> since their kindergarten. It didn't sound like any fun to them. But now they've had exposure to students. So we're building bridges. And that's the biggest part of the community garden. It's for the community. And the events that we have, bring more people in who don't, never thought about gardening, but they got an invitation to the party. Everybody's invited to the party. It's a garden party. It's the Sunday after Labor Day. We start at five o'clock. We stay till dark or mosquitoes run us off. Okay. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Are there other, I, I want to um, take maybe five more minutes and then open it up to the audience for questions for the panel. So does anyone else have some constraints that they want to share that you haven't already addressed? I'll be brief. Uh, our constraints are is, is we're a startup business and so uh, what we're doing is it's just not there's not a lot of uh, places to go and look at examples of how to do it that are in East Central Illinois. I mean we can look at examples of how this worked in Wisconsin or, or California or, or uh, wherever uh, but you can download those of course off the internet and so uh, but their circumstances are a little bit different and their structure is a little bit different so uh, the challenge is is, is we're making decisions on the fly and some of them we're, we're pretty sure we're, we're going to be right on a lot of them but we're going to miss uh, you know I spoke at a group with a group in Bloomington about this and I had a gentleman come up to me from northern Illinois and say well, you know, uh, we'd love to see any documents that you have of how you uh, did a, a study on this and how much work did you put into to studying this in a comprehensive plan. I said, I'm sorry, I have nothing to, to give to you. We made a decision that we thought this was the right way to go and we, we took a leap. I said, you can study it and, and that's great. Uh, and, and you'll probably maybe be ahead of us. But I said, at the end of the day, I said, we just took a chance and said, this is the right thing to do. There's a demand for it. Let's do it. And so we didn't do any studying of years of this and market analysis. We just said, we're going to make it work. And the results are there. We've made it work. Uh, you know, we've got people connected to the land. So uh, we're making it happen. Um, the challenge that I'm going to share is um, more related to customers. One of the things that we try to do at the market is make the products there accessible to everyone. Um, the USDA says that one out of six um, people in Illinois use their SNAP benefits or receive SNAP benefits and so um, the markets had a program called Market Scratch. This is be at least six plus years that we've um, been able to accept link cards um, from customers to exchange for little wooden tokens that they can use at vendors that sell fruit bearing plants, um, produce, uh, meat, dairy, honey, I know I'm leaving some things out there, but that kind of gives you an idea. Um, and so there aren't very many farmers markets that, that have those types of programs in Illinois. And with one out of six Illinoisans receiving those benefits, you would hope that there would be more markets that have programs like that. So um, one thing that we did this past year is we worked with UPTV, that's Urbana Public Television, 
um, to produce some videos for market managers. Um, the Lieutenant Governor's Office um, helped us with it and we sent the videos out to all the Illinois markets and said, hey, this is how you start a program. We showed the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District and Market at the Square because we both use different types of systems, but that it's not burdensome, that it's easy, that it's great for our customers, um, it increases access and um, you know, hopefully we'll see more farmers markets have, starting those programs this year, but um, the other thing is that for at least four years we've had double value coupons. So if you have a link card, you'd come swipe it at the market. Um, say you would want $20, well we would give you an additional $20, no strings attached. It's called double value coupons. Um, we didn't have that um, opportunity last year. It was a grant and the grant had run out. Um, and we weren't the only market in that situation in Illinois. And so the, the link usage at the market went down last year and I talked to some of my colleagues in other parts of the state that have um, programs like ours and they said that that was the, the same thing was happening there. So um, there's a lot of us working together to try to figure out ways to make it better this year, um, bring back those double value coupons and if not that, some other type of program that will increase access at farmers markets and hopefully we'll see that in 2015. But. It's definitely been a, a conversation happening over the past year. I'm glad you touched upon that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rick. Um, challenges or limitations. Uh, we will submit a new proposal hoping to be funded again to continue beginning farmer training. And the things we need to add to what we've done before is to expand our reach. We used our research and education centers at our University of Illinois facilities at St. Charles, here in Dixon Springs, all of which are on the east side of the state. So our expansion will be to try to reach to the west and to do that in cooperation with the community colleges that have horticulture and local foods programs. We'll also add to our content because local foods includes more than fruits and vegetables. We made a proposal to teach to our strength for the people who were involved in it. That's why we limited our program as we did to be competitive and to look better than others because we focused on our strength. So we'll expand content in other areas of local food production. That's our challenge. For the people who are in our class, I think the challenges do include land and capital. That's, there's no doubt about that. Um, the reason we focused on fruits and vegetables is because it's a lot easier to make a living on six or eight or ten acres of vegetables than it is to try to move into commodity crop production and make money on small acres. So it is a doable thing. That's the reason for that focus and it is food crops for people. The challenges that our students have typically lie not so much in growing in a general sense but in planning to develop a business rather than to grow. Uh, many of them, like perhaps some of you, might like plants more than people on some days. <laughs> and as a result of that, developing a direct market business is a challenge. It's a challenge to deal with modern day and perhaps necessary new rules on food safety, right? And as you move from being a gardener to a farmer, the challenges of equipment and labor become big things. So it's not the same to garden as it is to farm. Uh, there, that's their challenges. And if there's a sort of larger challenge to those of us from the U of I extension side in doing this, it clearly has to do with declining federal and state funds. Um, as the campus as a whole deals with that, uh, many of you who are students know this, one of the answers is to increase tuition, right? Uh, but when we do extension programs, cost recovery is only a minor part of that. We don't do that for most extension programs. We don't charge tuition of any meaningful way that pays the salary of the extension educators or the faculty. And so we have many, many fewer educators in extension or faculty people like me who have a, a, a sizable portion of my position described to be go out and work with farmers to solve these problems. We don't have that anymore. The numbers are declining greatly and as long as we rely on tuition as the basis that campus uses to approve or, or not approve positions, then we will not hire people to do extension work in the way we did in the past. We are remarkably smaller than we were when I joined this organization 30 years ago. 
are probably well fewer than 20% as many extension people, not loss of 20, but 20 left. We are less than 20% of the staffing level we were 30 years ago, all right? And the problems haven't, in, haven't decreased by 80%. So um, thank you very much. We are gonna go to one o'clock. I know there are some students that might be leaving for class. I always feel like when you break for questions that then you miss an opportunity to say thank you to the guests. And I am like proud as peaches to live in Urbana for a lot of reasons, but it's folks like you that make this community really worth living in. And I really appreciate your work and I wanna show it now before we open for questions. So thank you very much. So with that, if you wanna raise your hand, we've got two mics and we'll be walking around so you can ask some questions. A question for Brad: the the land that you um, are have acquired or in ran two is that reclaimed? Do you have to improve that? Is that an old parking lot or is that um, shovel ready kind of? And um, and if it is a parking lot, how did you do that? Uh, the land that uh, that we have available has been in in grass uh, for the last 20, 30 years, and so what we've been able to do is remove a few of the trees that were on there, uh, and and it is has been had a first pass tillage on it. Uh, we anticipate that any that the growers who are going to lease it for for this year, and then for potential growers will have to do another pass to kind of work it into shape. Uh, but that land is uh, again it has been it's not been part parking lot, it's been grass, and uh, has been that way for an extended period of time. And uh, how much of that land is on the Chanute Air Force Base? Uh, at this time, all of the land is on the former Chanute Air Force Base. Um, have you seen an article by Bob Bajic uh, that alleges there's Agent Orange uh, contamination? Um, yes, I've, I've read that article. I've, I've talked to uh, Mr. Doug Rocky about uh, various aspects of, of, their, of his concerns and concerns with that article, and, and we're trying to address and deduce our due diligence of double-checking some things, uh, both through uh, Doug, uh, through, the, uh, to the, through the village, and the, the appropriate officials. Thank you for your patience as we run these around. Thank you. I do have a question. Um, the food movement is really quite big today. Um, and, you know, this idea of food justice, I'm wondering exactly what, what's being intervened in. So what is, what is the unjustness that you guys are working to rectify? And so that thereby, what is food justice? Well. The area of the north end of Champaign has no grocery stores. Uh, when I took over Stewart, there wasn't even the family dollar where you could purchase food. There were only convenience stores uh, with junk food and sodas. You couldn't even buy milk, an apple, an orange. You know how the, the, the gas stations carry apple, orange, banana? Not even apple, orange, banana. So when people, are disenfranchised in that manner. You, you look at the stores, the grocery stores are out North Prospect. When the first stores started moving out there, there wasn't even a sidewalk to get out there. You had to walk on the shoulder of the road. The buses didn't run out there. You had to push your groceries home in a, a cart or the baby buggy. So it means that it makes it difficult for people to get healthy food and it impacts their lives because you see a lot of more obesity and eating disorders, everything. So that's, an, that's the injustice. So bringing food to people and, and making it available for them to purchase, teaching them to grow it themselves is the justice part of it, to bring them back into the loop so that they can take control of those. Everybody's gotta eat. And when you can't get food, it's, it's just as, bad as not being able to get healthy food. Does anyone else want to speak to that question? There is also a broader food security issue, not just in the sense of economics and, and communities, but simply nationally, internationally. 
uh, folks, if we're concerned about climate change, we have to remember that a great deal of the domestic production of fruits and vegetables is in areas that have been, that are plagued by some of the worst problems with drought uh, and challenges because of what happens in the future. Um, and that includes some of what we move internationally. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have a global food system that gets me coffee and oranges because I like both of them, but I'd also like to know that we had a little greater capacity to return to the vegetable production and processing capacity we had 30 years ago or 60 years ago. So there is an issue about how much do we rely on transportation, how much do we rely on political uh, international circumstances remaining at least okay. All of that has got to be part of this question about how local does our food system have to be. And we're never going to get a food system in southern Illinois that prevents people from having to drive to food because they're all too far spread apart. But even at that, there are large areas that don't have grocery stores. We can talk about going from downtown to North Prospect. You can't find uh, in one southern Illinois county a true supermarket in the entire county. All right? So it's not, it's a broad issue. Natalie, would you mind speaking just a minute about um, the partnership between the farmer's market and the Eastern Illinois Food Bank? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the, it's called the Farm to Food Bank program. Um, it, I think it's in its fifth or sixth year, uh, also this year. And on the vendor applications, vendors can choose to participate in this program. We don't require it, um, but we end up having at least a dozen, two dozen maybe vendors that, part, that check that they want to participate. And the Eastern Illinois Food Bank will come um, to the market between the first weekend of July and typically the first weekend of October. Sometimes it changes a little bit, just kind of depends on, on how things are going that year at the market. Um, and I, with our online map, they know which vendors are participating in the Farm to Food Bank program. And if the farmer has any ex extra produce at the end of the day, they'll package it up. And there is a driver from the food bank that goes around with a dolly. There's volunteers that come and they take all of that. They load it onto this truck that the food bank comes and parks at the market. And, and we do that every weekend during those months. And I think last year we had 13,000 pounds of, of produce donated to this farm to food bank program. And it, and it pretty much between 12 and 13,000 pounds. I, just, I, want, years. I wanted that shared because I think as a consumer, that's something that you don't really see. But as a right. vendor working for the farm this last year, it was such a slick operation and it was just amazing to see how much produce came from vendors, was boxed up very efficiently, went to the food bank where it can be distributed to those that need it. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm really um, glad that the, the market's doing that yeah, and it's the food a, bank as well. It's a great program and you know the market staff we know at about a quarter till noon we'll see the food bank, we'll hear the food bank truck pull up to the barricades, we'll run and pull the barricades so the truck can come in, otherwise no cars in the market, remember that. Um, and then we help them navigate to see who's going to be there and that's, it's been, it's been great. Real staff, they do it fast. Yeah. I would also just note, back to the question about where's the justice on this, um, that w um, the whole series is themed around food justice, so each of our different weeks has a different facet of conversation about food justice. And on, in the, commi on the, for the committee's part, when we talked about local, it was partly that something different happens when food is grown locally. Um, that it's actually grown within the context of community and that producers can then respond to issues of justice in a different way than when food is, you know, from far away and you have no idea who your growers are. So there is a, an element of relationship, I think, with local food that can, where justice can come in more easily. Are there other questions? Yeah, I have a follow-up uh, for Mr. Yukon on my previous question. Um, weren't there plans last year to do the same thing uh, with these 16 acres on the Chanute base and they were scaled back uh, to just a Future Farmers of America plot because of the contamination issue? 
That's what I've heard anecdotally. Yeah, no, uh, we were we were not uh, at that point last year. Uh, the FFA chapter has been growing uh, produce on on the uh, in this area for the last several years, but no, that was not uh, it was not scaled back from last year. The FFA had chapter had two acres last year. Uh, they had two acres the year before. Or so I heard a talk you gave uh, in 2013 for the CCNet group. And I remember asking you at the end of the talk uh, if, if the area that you were going to grow in uh, was part of the area of the Chanute base that had been contaminated with Agent Orange because it was used widely on that base as a defoliant um, to get rid of weeds. And uh, you said, oh no, this is in a different area. But I've heard that there's documents in the Rantoul Library that uh, are based on testimony from a person who worked there uh, that show that the, the contamination is much larger than uh, what people have been led to believe. Again, uh, we are uh, we take that obviously very seriously, uh, and have moved forward with some things, and have pulled back on some things, and have done some visiting with different officials, uh, and, and again continue to our effort to double check to make sure that the that the safety is there. Okay, we're about out of time. Is there one final burning question? Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for each one of you to come out today. Um, I'm an ACE major and I'm kind of asking many people I'm coming across um, this a simple question, um, but I know it, it leads into other questions as well. Um, but for each of you, if you could please respond to the question, do you feel as though that food justice, um, do you feel as though it's, uh, it's a right as, as a human necessity or do you think it's a privilege because you have to till and work the land? I think that um, as human beings, a basic right has got to be food. Um, if corporations can have a right to profit, people certainly can have a right to food. Did you want us all to answer? I think everyone has a right to food. Um, I didn't know how to grow anything. I've learned a whole lot since running the market. Um, and now I have my kids involved. And that's why we have a Sprouts at the Market program. That's why we're working on adult education at the market. Um, because maybe they don't have the ability or the, the property to grow something. Um, but they can establish a relationship with the farmers and and learn what to do with those products and when they're in season and why they're good for them and why they should eat certain. I, I do that with my kids all the time. Eat the rainbow. How many colors do you have on your plate? Why is red good for you? Which vegetable helps with healthy bones and, and, and teeth and vision? So I don't know if that answers your question, but I could go on and on about sprouts at the market. <laughs> Personal opinion, yes, everybody has a right to healthy food. My job is to help people produce things, so I typically don't focus on the big issue, I focus on what I can do. I can help train people to grow food. And I let the political argument go on separately, except for me as an individual, not me as a person for the U of I. Uh, I think uh, connecting people to the land is important. I think it adds a whole other aspect to, to life and society for many individuals. And so uh, the local food production, again, is an opportunity to connect people with land uh, and, and using their hands and growing uh, uh, something that they're going to consume. And I think that's very critical. Um, Ms. Blackman, you talked about the importance of the kitchen. Is there much movement here? Or um, if there is a movement, I wonder if we could bring um, to the table having a community certified community kitchen. Do you see that there is a need with the markets, with processors? I know other cities have done it, and it's really been great in, mobilize, you know, in further mobilizing the local food movement. And just uh, welcome your thoughts on that. I think there's a need. I think that having a community kitchen would help in two ways because uh, we're not our young people aren't getting home ec anymore a lot of times in school uh, we have a cooking program at the school uh, Thursdays and Fridays all year long for the kids 
and there's a, a general need for them to learn how to prepare food and to, to learn how to plan a meal. There's also a dearth of places where community can come together to celebrate and to have a meal. So if we had kitchens that people could have access to even on a hourly basis for a fee, it would make our community a better place. We don't have, we have hungry people in this community who don't have a, a house to take. We have homeless hungry. And to see people lined up for, a, for lunch at New Covenant um, on a daily basis and know that they're going without dinner a lot of times. The cost of housing keeps a lot of working people poor. Food, the food budget becomes what you can manipulate within your household. It's your controllable um, income.